Hi, welcome to another edition of Design Spark Ask the Expert. Today we're going to be talking about EMC. I have Worth Electronic and I have Mohammed. Hi, Mohammed. Do you want to say hello to Design Spark? Hi, Greg. Hello, everybody. Thank you for involving us in this discussion. My name is Mohammed Al Alami. I'm a senior field applications engineer with Worth Electronics. I've been with the company for many years. I come from a power supply design and development environment uh, or background, sorry. And for my sins, I have done electromagnetic compatibility testing. Great. So every design engineer should be interested in, in EMC, but why is EMC important and, and why should we care about it? And that's a very good question. It's um, it's important from two points of view. The first is it's a legal requirement and we will go into the legality side of things in a second. Uh, but the other aspect is it's from a product functional integrity and safety. So this is very key for uh, you putting your product on the market to ensure that it's going to function as expected. Uh, people tend to think it's just uh, a piece of paper that you need to get as a, to say that you're conform to EMC requirements. It's not. It's very important from a functional point of view for your product. So going to the legal side of things, um, be it the EU EMC directive or its equivalent UK regulations 2016, which we introduced after Brexit, uh, both these uh, set out the requirements for any product to be put on the UK or the um, uh, EU markets. Uh, that these products need to maintain a certain a set of what's called essential requirements. Now, these essential requirements basically say that your product must not interfere with intentional radio, telecommunication, and any other signals surrounding us. Um, so from an emissions point of view, your product is not allowed to interfere with other intentional radio signals. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that your product also must be immune to what exists around us in terms of intended RF signals, radio signals, telecommunication, navigation, etc. Uh, so that um, your product will continue to operate as intended without degradation of performance. Mm -hmm. So these are the two key aspects from a legal point of view that you need to meet. Um, um, and that's why EMC is quite important. OK, so your product shouldn't affect other pieces of equipment or product and shouldn't be affected by them also. So how do you achieve compliance? So in order to achieve this, and as you can see, these are two descriptive uh, requirements there, so there's no set limits or, or conditions associated with these. This is where you take it to what's called harmonized standards in the EU and in the UK, we call them designated standards. Now these are uh, basically standards that contain test setups and test limits um, and they some of them are basic some of them are generic uh, some of them are family or product orientated so uh, depending on what your product is you will select the suitable standard norm uh, to test your product against and this for me is the method to use or the preferred method the standard method to use in order to achieve compliance. Uh, now, um, where you would do this naturally in, in an approved EMC test house, and that's also another advantage to this because the test house would be able to advise you as to which standard that you will need, your product needs to adhere to, to show this presumption of conformity against those essential requirements we mentioned in, in the EU directive or the EMC regulations in the UK. So this is sort of the, a simplification, if I can say it, of, of that loop. Uh, the devil is in the detail, so there is a lot more uh, than meets the eye with this. Um, that also involves what's called maintaining a technical file as part of your due diligence you need to do some risk analysis and assessment of your product because you'll be testing your product under certain conditions so you'll also need to assess what happens under different conditions different loading different environmental conditions as to whether this uh, is likely to impact the emi signature performance of your product so all of this is part of your compliance of uh, your product OK, so if you change by, say, design of the product or intended use of the product, do you have to retest or is it another way you can still keep the certification going? 
I uh, we have I've seen this before. I've had to go through this in in a previous life um, in the aerospace industry, and and you do have several options with this. Uh, one is naturally to go and retest, but we know that that's quite expensive as well, mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to necessarily do the full EMC testing. You can also have targeted testing depending on the type of change that has taken place. Um, so this is one of the options. Another option is to uh, maybe justify the, that there is no need for any further testing, and that can be done by simulations or calculations, uh, uh, engineering assessment. So you could put in a report together to indicate that, yeah, the, based on the analysis done, that we do not foresee any changes taking place. But that, of course, needs to have sound engineering judgment behind it. Yeah. And that was also included in your technical uh, file as part of your uh, assessment. Uh, but it tends to most likely be testing is the best route for this uh, uh, in a way that you can uh, clearly say that, OK, the test results show that there is no changes in performance, form, fit and function, uh, EMI signature is all the same. So it's fine. There's no issues. Um, and again, you can do spot check testing. You don't have to do the, the entire full suite of EMC tests. Right. OK, so Mohammed, just in terms of the differences between um, conducted and radiated, could you just tell me what what tests need to be performed and what they are? That's a, a very good question again here because a lot of people tend to look at uh, EMC from just the basic conducted and radiated emissions and immunity, which basically reflect what the essential requirements of the directive say. Uh, but EMC is more than that. Uh, there is also over voltage protection. Uh, type tests, uh, ESD and EFT, electrostatic discharge, electrical fast transient, as well as surge to simulate over voltage um, threats to your unit. Um, there is also in some occasions, depending on the type of product that you have, uh, things like harmonic content, harmonic current content, yeah. um, voltage flicker, dips and interrupts and so on. So depending on which industry you're following, uh, the tests can vary, but there are quite a wide range of different tests that need to be performed um, um, for the product. And that uh, the EMC test house would be able to advise you on which tests would be more relevant to your type of product. Um, so I think that's uh, that's from a, a conducted and a radiated side of things. Um, the main difference between conducted and radiated um, is that the medium through which we transfer uh, the signal noise. So from a conducted point of view, uh, the conducted emissions are conducted, as it says, over uh, copper cables, wires and uh, traces, for example, or harnesses. And the radiated side of things from an emissions or an immunity point of view is radiated through air. So that is noise that is radiated from your enclosure, from a particular component, a noisy IC or a transformer or an inductor and so on. So this is this is the main difference between the what we say, what we call conducted and radiated. OK, great. And in terms of the design process, when, when is it an engineer should consider EMC in that design stage? Uh, that's a critical question, and uh, I mean, I know from experience myself that you know we started off with considering EMC relatively late, uh, or the, at a relatively late stage of the design. My advice is, and throughout my work, uh, my working life and experience is, uh, the design as early at an earlier stage as you can. Uh, this saves you a lot of cost and a lot of headache further down the line. And I, I will just explain to you based on uh, my own experience, like I've said, I mean, in, in uh, if you, we do not, let's say, and we just leave EMC to a latter stage of the design, uh, the issue is not just going to be that you're having to use massive components like cable ferrites to achieve your compliance and to pass your test limits. Uh, that's going to be an issue, but that's not going to be the, the main issue. The main issue is sometimes these, uh, which they are band aids, might not be sufficient. So it means that you're going to have to re spin your PCB. Sometimes you may even have to change your enclosure. So this is where the costs mount substantially. And this is this means that you're unable to put your product on the market when yeah. you want to put your product on the market. So this is also delays and that's where it can hurt a lot while. If we consider EMC from a very early stage of the design, we're talking now very small, tiny components, capacitors, chip bead ferrites, common mode chokes. They take up a lot less space 
and they are a lot cheaper. So it's just a no brainer for me. Um, consider it from the outset is my advice. Yeah, you don't want to get to the end of the design stage and have to go right back to basics. I could imagine that's very costly. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. Yeah. So so when designing for EMC compliance, it's a bit like creating barriers between electronic equipment. So how, how is that done and what are the products that you guys have at worth that we're talking about that can help design engineers meet EMC? Yes, absolutely. I mean, Barriers is a really good word, um, and I think that's what it sort of, in essence or in simple terms, what it boils down to. That emissions and that immunity you need to put in a block against, you need to put an attenuator there. Now, that means that what you're looking for to begin with is to identify where on your design your noise sources are, the areas which are likely to radiate or conduct uh, that noise that we were talking about. And um, accordingly, once these are identified, you need to introduce the right type of filtering, or again, over voltage protection, or again, shielding. Mm -hmm. So all of these are different barriers that we can introduce in order to stop noise coming out or coming in. Em emissions and immunity are two sides to a similar coin. So tends to be that solutions that are used for emissions are also good for immunity as well. But the idea behind this is to introduce these barriers. The other aspect of identifying the most suitable barrier is the trans, what's called the transmission mode of the noise. Mm -hmm. Is it, conduct, is it uh, sorry, common mode or differential mode? That's for conducted noise. Um, so that also uh, will um, determine the type of filtering that you will need to use on that interface. So that's one aspect. From a worth's point of view, we have got a full range of products when it comes to EMC. Uh, we are known in the market as uh, the EMC gurus, albeit our product range has diversified a lot over the past years. But, you know, common mode chokes, chip bead ferrites, capacitors of all types and kinds, um, shielding materials uh, over voltage protection in the form of varistors or transient voltage suppressors for data lines, for power lines, you'll find. So components wise, we have got a lot, uh, but not only components, I'd like to also talk about tools. Um, we have got a tool called Red Expert. It's a really nice tool. Um, started off as a selection tool for our product range. I mean, maybe we can have that link available on, on DesignSpark. I think um, DesignSpark as a platform uh, is really great in that you know, it can have the access to this variety of different tools available, which I will explain about um, or talk about in a bit as well. Um, so Red Expert is really good in that it doesn't just help you select components, but it also helps you with the calculation side of things. Um, all you need to do is sign up for the tool and you will see a lot of these um, uh, facilities available. Um, another aspect that we also support our customers with are things like um, application notes. That can also be quite useful when it comes to how to design filtering or optimizing inductor selection and quite a wide range of various different uh, apps notes that we also have uh, on our website. Um, you have got FAE support, so um, uh, as, as an extra um, um, support from an EMI point of view. Um, and finally, also we, uh, uh, we have a variety of different filter boards that you can also uh, have uh, to build your own filters, be it DC filters for DC interfaces or an AC mains filter as well. So all of these uh, will help before you go into the EMC test facility or as you are designing for your EMC. Great. Yeah, we'll certainly put some of the links into those uh, those tools and uh, papers that you, you mentioned. So what final tips would you give for EMC, for, for example, are there any common issues that engineers often overlook? And, you know, yeah, we will find more information at Worth and we'll put the links in. But if you could just comment on that, that'd be great. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the things, first of all, I guess, um, is when when I sit here and say, oh, you need to identify the noisy parts of your circuit. I know a lot of people, me included, when we started designing, we didn't. We know. We knew very little about EMI. It's, it's not something that is taught at universities, and it's something that you gain by experience. And it is a bit of a black art, but we try to demystify it as best as we can. 
Uh, and part of this is, yes, you are, it's going to be difficult for you to identify where these noise sources are. So one thing that you can do to guard against this or to help you with this is identify, first of all, ins and outs of your unit. So interfaces, in other words, power is always one. Data, of course, is another, and there's quite a wide range of data out there. And for this, you will find on our website a place called an application or a link called an application guide. That application guide's got all different types of interfaces, like I mentioned, CAN, USB, um, um, HDMI, etc. And for each one of these, you'll have a set filter interface. Now, a filter is not just an L and a C, it's also over voltage protection common mode filtering if needs be. So that's a nice copy and paste without you having to think. So you're ruggedizing your design before you've started. So that's one uh, key aspect of you trying to introduce um, some level of, um, uh, I guess, um, immunity to the noise to your design before you have started. Um, another um, key aspect of this is layout and tracking. Now, um, I dare say, and I, and I know a lot of people forget about this, you can put in so much filtering, so much good EMI design and fail on the layout and tracking. And yeah. it's like you don't have any filters there. Um, it's um, it can really um, um, shoot you in the foot. Uh, it is uh, if you don't take into consideration good layout and tracking practices. Um, I even dare say as that can mitigate a lot of your EMI uh, issues and, and problems further down the line. Um, so there's uh, quite a few of, um, of these issues that we see with layout and tracking, and we do have some recommendations as well for certain key components uh, that you put in on your design to make sure that you don't fall foul of this. Uh, another um, also um, maybe a final one that I can say, and I know lots of engineers use this, is simulate. Simulate the performance of your filters ahead of introducing them. It's a quick and easy way. You can use LT Spice. We've got all of our models for our inductors, capacitors, chip beat for us in LT Spice. So that is a, a very nice and simple tool. Allows you to have a good indication of the insertion loss of your filter. Um, and with good models, you'll have a good uh, um, um, filter response behavior. So it's not going to show you something that's idealistic, which is, you know, there's no need for simulating that, to be honest with you, unless you have got a decent uh, model for those in LT Spice. So a, a combination of all of this helps you guard against um, sort of EMI issues. What would remain is anything that is more radiated, associated with particular components, ICs, uh, microprocessors, uh, noisy parts, and for that, uh, you can also guard against with some level of shielding, uh, shielding cabinets within your design itself. Uh, that can be quite useful from an early design stage. So you can introduce the potential for a shielding cabinets about, uh, around a particular, maybe a module that you've bought yeah. in externally that you do not necessarily maybe design yourself and you have got no control of introducing any further filtering components on that module. So a shielding can surrounding that would be a good idea. It's those sort of practices that you can embed in your design process from an early stage. And then if you need it, it's there. If you don't, you don't have to introduce it, but it's better to have it than to have to respin the PCB or change the enclosure, etc. Yeah, so Mohammed, I know EMC and EMC design is key to every engineer to, to make sure that they are, they are giving good product at the end of the day. So. I really do thank you for your time today, joining Design Spark and explaining EMC and EMI. So thanks for your time again, and I hope we see you on Design Spark again real soon. It's a pleasure, Greg, and thank you again for giving me the opportunity, this opportunity, and all the best to you and to everybody on Design Spark. See you in the future.